So let's get started. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today. I'm Anakshi Samarikram and I'm hosting this session, a careers talk series organized by the School of English at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. So today's talk is titled Worlds Upon Worlds, Writing for Video Games. And our speaker, Bernice Trolley, will talk about her experiences in telling <clears throat> stories as a writer for video games. A warm welcome to you, Bernice. Thank you for joining us today. So a little bit about a little bit about Bernice. Um, she's an award winning novelist, poet and educator who has worked extensively in the creative industries for three decades. She's currently working on the AAA Open World Video Game Contraband in development with Avalanche Studios Group and Xbox. She lives in Stockholm. Right, so we're all very excited to hear from Bernice. But before that, just a couple of things. Please make sure you have your audio turned off during the talk to avoid disruptions. We will be having a Q&A session afterwards, so you can ask your questions and make any comments then. So now on to um, Bernice. Hi, like uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, very clear. Okay, good morning. Welcome. Um, welcome from Stockholm. Good. It's a very sunny morning. Uh, it's still in the winter, but yeah, I just wanted to say it's it's triple A. So when we when we talk about oh, games that are right. of um, really really big budgets, it's triple A. Mm. Um, yeah. So I will let's let's maybe start with um, the one minute show reel just to give mm. everyone an idea of the so the studio that I'm working with. If we can do that. Yes, we can. There it is. So this is the studio that I'm working for, um, and it's based in Stockholm. It's been around for about 20 years, and Avalanche is known for its um, big open worlds, very vast worlds. Um, one of our most successful games is called The Wild, The Hunter, which is set in forests around the world. Um, we also did uh, Mad Max, and it is particularly known for its Just Cause series. So um, I've been working on this AAA game called Contraband for about almost three years now. And I started this job um, right before the pandemic hit or just right after the pandemic hit. And I started as an advisory council member. So this game is set in Southeast Asia in the 1970s. And it's AAA, which means it's really, really big budget. Uh, when we say AAA in video games, it means it's sort of like a Hollywood budget something like that. So we're looking at a lot of money. Um, and I started out as an advisory council member. So they got gathered a panel of experts from Southeast Asia. And because it's an Xbox game, um, DEI is a very, very important part of a representation in, in all Microsoft games and Xbox games. And I was an advisory council member on issues that um, related to culture, architecture, history and, and a lot of issues that concern the world that we're building. And then they moved me on to the narrative team in September of that year. And I've been working um, with the game ever since remotely in Kuala Lumpur for 18 months. And they moved me here to Stockholm in October of 2021. So um, I'll just get into the presentation. Can we start sharing the presentation? Do you, do you want me to share it? Yes, I'm not, I'm not going to touch anything just in case I mess things up again. Okay. 
No problem. So this is the PowerPoint, yeah? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, great. So writing for video games is a very, very specific kind of task. And I know that I said that in the blurb that, you know, writers matter, that, you know, it, we have to create purpose and meaning in the kinds of games we do. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of games out there. And how many of you are gamers? I'm sure a lot of you are gamers. Um, um, so this is the kind of uh, work that I'm doing at the moment. It's very, very different from, from what I've done in the past. Uh, some of you know that I taught at Nottingham for almost six years, uh, taught creative writing and poetry and prose. And before that, I was also teaching at Taylor's University and so on and so forth. A uh, lot of experience with, with teaching creative writing. I myself have written uh, books. I have a novel, I have a memoir. I have four collections of poetry and prose, collection of short stories. Um, and how did I land myself here? Well, it was chance and opportunity and um, and it's a really, really exciting time to be a writer in video games. So when I'm talking about writing, it's very specifically for narrative driven games because there are a lot of different kinds of games that don't require as much of, of a narrative structure and, and grounding as, um, as you would for, for a game like what we're doing now. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, Yes, writing is important, but um, nobody really. Are, but at the same time, writing is important to a degree. Next slide, please. The writer can always press delete. And this is a, a, a Dave Mongan, someone I've been working with very closely from Xbox. Um, so these are things that you have to kind of bear in mind that yes, you are working in an industry that is driven completely by tech. And what exactly does that mean? Um, let's go to the next slide. So a game like Ghost of Tsushima um, is a fantastic game and it should be Ghost, not Ghosts of Tsushima. I thought I'd change that. Um, it's a fantastic game. It's it's historically based. It's set in in feudal Japan and talks. You know, it looks at the Mongol invasion of Japan. This game was written by Sucker Punch, which is an American um, studio, very small studio, uh, four American writers who spent years researching this. And of course, if you're creating a game that has historical grounding, that is that is of the real world, that happened in reality, even though you're fictionalizing it, you have to know what you're doing, and that inclu includes a lot of research, a lot of collaboration, a lot of working with original sources, a lot of, you know, just how do we phrase this? How do we structure this? How do we create a character who matters to, um, to the player? So when I mention the player, it's basically you. You as the person who enters the game, who enters this world um, with agency to want to invest your time and energy um, into a product that is a triple A video game. So Ghost of Tsushima, of course, is a game that is grounded a lot in the real world. It has a very strong narrative structure. So again, it contradicts the first slide. You know, nobody cares about your stupid story. Well, actually they do, but how do you manifest that in a world that is like this? Next slide, please. So Elden Ring was game of the year last year. And even though it was, you know, sort of co-created um, um, with George R. R. Martin, who was the creator of Game of Thrones, it had actually very little dialogue. You didn't engage. You only engaged with someone um, occasionally in the world. Um, the player doesn't speak. So it's a silent protagonist. You are the player. You don't speak at all. And on the other hand, you have Hades, which is a game um, that is a roguelike, which has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of lines. So you have these two extremes of a game that is set in a beautiful world um, with very little dialogue and something like Hades, which won um, um, the Hugo Award, which is a fantasy award for best uh, video game. So you have these two kinds of games, very, very contrasting, very different, but at the same time, grounded on narrative, grounded on a world that you, the writer, has to create. So from Ghost of Tsushima to Elden Ring to Hades, we've already got three very different kinds of games that rely so heavily on narrative, but at the same time in very, very different ways. Uh, next slide, please. 
And you have something like The Witcher 3 and Zelda. Witcher 3 is an absolute masterpiece of a game. Um, I've started playing it. I've played a lot of it. Um, and it's there's so much in the world and everything that happens in the world. You go into an inn, you meet someone, you talk to them. That's writing. That's narrative design. You have to write that. You as the writer, you have to write that. With Zelda Breath of the Wild, it's a Nintendo game. It's a really, really, really great game. Um, there is also a lot of narrative grounding in the world. So again, two very different games. One is um, um, uh, Japanese um, studio. Nintendo is one of the biggest uh, publishers in the world. And um, The Witcher 3, also very, very successful. You have the character of Geralt, uh, who is your, your, you know, you're basically playing. This is a single player RPG role playing game. So again, you know, I've given you five different examples of how narrative informs the world of this particular, um, of a particular game. Okay, so let me go talk a little bit now about the industry of video games because it is, next slide. Game dev is chaos. It is absolute chaos. Um, I'm sure you've heard about stories of how games take so long that they are delayed. You know, Skull and Bones, which is uh, coming out of Ubisoft Singapore, has taken what, seven years. It's probably going to take another two years, three years. It is chaos because, because it is extremely difficult. You're working with multiple teams. You know, like I said earlier, video games is driven by tech. So everything has to reside, has to live in an engine. Um, and when you feed that engine information and data, uh, it, it has to work, but at the same time, you have, at the moment, I am working with a team of at least 135 people in two studios, and we're trying to make one game. Um, it's extremely complicated. There are no hard and fast rules for making a game because every game is different, and every game that is produced is nothing short of a miracle. So game dev is chaos and it's probably gonna stay that way for a very long time. <laughs> Next slide. So when we're talking about um, world building and narrative in a video game, it has to matter. And ethical world, build, world building has to matter. So when you're talking about world design, level design, let's uh, maybe look at uh, Elden Ring, for example, you've got the history, you've got the lore, you've got terrain. And bear in mind, everything that you see in your video game has to be built. Everything has to be built. Every leaf, every rock, every cloud, every tree, everything that you, the player wears, everything has to be built from scratch. So your world design, your level design is informed by the history of the place, by the lore, what sort of myths, by the terrain. And then you have the art direction. So I'm just looking at different teams that sort of are um, part of making a video game. So we start with world design, level design, and you start with the history of the place. Where are we in the world? Is it fictional? Is it fantastical? Does it exist? Is it underwater? Is it in the sky? Where is it? And everything has to have some kind of history. How did it come to be? What are some of the myths? What are the terrains that you are, you as the player are going to traversing. And then you have the art direction, you have the tech, um, which is driven by tech again, you have the environment, you have VFX, you have lighting. And these are all styles, like how, what, what kind of style is it? What are the influences we're looking at? If you look at a game like Assassin's Creed, you know, which is set in so many different real historical um, spaces, whether it's ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, you have to understand that there are specific ways in which you incorporate history into the game world, into the art direction, into the tech, into the environment that you're, that you're creating, into the VFX, into the special effects, into the lighting of the place. Um, so styles, influences, is it fictional, is it fantasy? Um, a lot of games have very specific weather systems. If you've played The Witcher 3, you will notice that there's always this kind of wind that's just blowing through all the time that is, that is created. Um, vegetation, what kind of vegetation are we working with? Is it a desert? Is it a rainforest? Is it a pine forest? So these are some of the things that have to... Oh, 
of the writer comes in when you are working with a narrative design. Now I'm going to use the word design a lot because everything has to have a design in video games. Nothing is random. Everything has to be written down in documents and every game has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents because that's how it all starts. Everything begins with writing. Narrative design um, includes what the player does in the world, missions, of course, why you're in the world, why you're playing this game, why some games are more fun than others. And of course, that informs the characters, whether it's a single player, um, whether it's multiplayer or co-op. Um, this informs dialogue. You know, how, how do you show narrative in the world? Um, do you have multiple characters speaking at the same time? Do you have auto logs? Do you have text boxes? Um, and then we move on to character art and animation. <clears throat> so what do your characters look like? What do they wear? How do they move in the world? Um, is it sort of realistic? Do we have to have a lot of hair? Do we have no hair? Does your character have tattoos? Um, how your characters move? So all of these things take a lot of time and you can already see in each, in each um, you know, sort of department I'm talking about, you have people, you have um, who are working on this every single day, every single day, taking direction, doing what needs to be done um, until the game is, is, um, is ready to be shipped. So gameplay design, this is really, really important. What is the core loop? Are, why are we in the world? Is it a shooter game? Are you killing dinosaurs? Are you shooting bad guys? Are you killing Nazis? Are you killing zombies? What are you doing? Why are you in the game? And is it interesting? So all of this ties into an ethical world that needs to be created. And I know that games in the past have been of a certain kind. And, and in today's world, games have to have a certain kind of ethical stance to the worlds that we create. What the player does in the world. This is very important. Why are you... I'm sure some of you have certain games that you like to play and certain games that you don't like to play. Uh, some people just don't like storytelling. You know, it's boring. They skip, 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 skip. They have to bear in mind um, because everything matters. Everything builds into the world that we're trying to create. And of course, you have UI and UX, so user interface, uh, user experience, and quality assurance. So these are just some of the different teams that are um, incorporated into um, into making a video game. And right at the end is your story. So you build all of this stuff, and at the end, you have your story. It's last, but it's not least. Next slide. Um, yeah, the, the quote I mentioned earlier, Ken Levine was the creator of Bioshock. And Bioshock is a really, really successful game. Um, it's beautifully made and it's set in an underwater city, um, the city of Rapture. How does someone come up with this? How do you create a world that is so vastly different from your own? Mind you, we're not making a film, we're not making a fantasy series, we're making a video game. And all of the technical um, aspects that I mentioned earlier have to tie into this ethical world that we're trying to create. Bioshock is one example of that. Um, let's look at the next slide. Uh, Death Stranding is a very, very beautiful game created by uh, Master Hideo Kojima. Um, Death Stranding is not a very, it's, it is a very specific kind of game. Um, it is very narratively driven. You are in a world that is sort of post-apocalyptic. You have a very specific mission to do. And you, as a player, are very, very much invested in the journey of your protagonist. Again, very different world from Bioshock. Um, next slide, please. And you have the Far Cry series, which is a very, very successful series. Um, Far Cry 3 is set on a tropical island. You have Vas, who is your, your sort of main antagonist. He has a lot of lines. So Far Cry 3 is set, you know, it's in the real world. It's not fantasy, it's not underwater. It's sort of a real world that is familiar to a lot of people. Again, going back to how to create an ethical world, Far Cry 3 has garnered um, some criticism, especially the last one. But I think Far Cry 3 is a very good example of 
of um, a really, really fantastic video game. Next slide, please. And of course, everyone is talking about The Last of Us, um, which is uh, the HBO series, Joel and Ellie's story being translated um, and adapted for the television screen has, again, revealed the vast um, reservoir of stories that can be made into a more accessible audience. But at the same time, and I will get to this later, the number of people who play video games is actually bigger than, than any other form of entertainment on the planet. So The Last of Us is a very, very uh, narratively driven game. Um, it's set in a world where um, a fungal inf infection has taken over most of humanity, and your purpose in the game is very simple. You want to kill um, the clickers. You want to kill the people who are going to infect you. That's a very clear so story loop. It's very simple, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in creating characters that matter to us. So again, going back to, the, to what I said earlier, that ethical world building has to matter in a game such as this. Okay, let's um, get into a few brass tacks now. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so why are we in the world? This is the setting. What is the world logic? Conflict, why should I care? And this relates to your character and the story. What is Ellie's journey? in the world? What is Joel's story in the world? And why should I keep playing? And this taps very much into the hero's journey. What is the game saying? What is the game really saying about the world we live in? And as a game devs, as people who are very, very much invested in stories and storytelling, we want to imbue purpose and meaning in the kind of work that we're doing. Um, next slide. So keep it simple, stupid. Understand thread structure. Stories last, but you have to write and rewrite and 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 write and rewrite until it gets to a point where you have a very, very solid product. You have something that works. Everything works. But this takes time. Because as a writer, and as I have, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked very, very closely with words. I've been a teacher. I've been, you know, working with um, the creative industries in in film, in documentary. I was an actor in television. Um, so everything is driven by tech, systems, and design. And as someone who's worked in the creative industries, the intersection of tech and and creativity is something that really really was very valuable when i when i joined this industry so i do consider myself a game dev at the moment um, i am a writer but i am working in a very very challenging industry that is very very chaotic but a reminder at the end of the day it has to be player driven it has to be replayable narrative and this is the core and this is hard this is really 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 hard to do. Um, every game is different. How you make a game is very different. Every studio has a different way of, how, of, of making games. So it is a very chaotic, chaotic industry, but at the same time, it's, it's the industry of the future, um, which leads me to my next slide. So video games are the future of storytelling. It's the future of tech. It's the future of entertainment. It is the future. 3.7 billion people on Earth are gamers. And this is the latest statistic. Um, China is the largest country in the world that has the most number of gamers, 665 million gamers. This is only as of 2020. So we are in 2023 now. We are probably looking at more gamers because of the pandemic and so on and so forth. So video games generate a lot of money, and we're looking at 40.85 billion in revenue alone, just in China. The US has 244 million gamers. More statistics, two of every five people in the world is a gamer. Now the fastest growing market is Southeast Asia, and this is not a surprise to many of you. Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, the Philippines, Vietnam are leading the way with 4.3 billion in revenue for mobile games in, these, in, these, in 2019 and 2020 alone. We're looking at more figures um, 
now, of course, because of the pandemic and so on and so forth. And because a lot of studios are also present in Southeast Asia that are creating games, um, which, are, which have a very, very specific Southeast Asian kind of slant. Malaysia alone has 21 million gamers who spent 670 million in 2020. And of course, that number is pre-pandemic. So it, it definitely has risen since then. So this is these figures are, are boggling. It's, um, it's a lot of people who spend a lot of money on, uh, on video games. And that's why when a studio is successful, when you sell a product that is you know, like Elden Ring, for example, um, you know, you sell 20 million copies in, the, in your first week or your first two weeks. Um, it's a lot of revenue that that keeps turning and keeps fueling the industry. And um, these are just figures, but just gives you an idea of what we're working with. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about my role um, in Avalanche. So my role in Contraband is senior writer and cultural advisor, and I'm responsible for all of these areas in building the game. So world building, history, working a lot with history, with lore and myth and setting. It's sort of a fictional island somewhere in the middle of Southeast Asia. Characters, I have had a very, very important part in creating the art, character art, um, animation, Looking for faces, you know, um, character faces, player characters, um, NPCs, world sim, because populating the world with with all the multiple um, Southeast Asian faces, um, level design and world design, what kind of terrain are we working with, um, architectural styles, what kind of environments are we working with, you know, working with water, working with clouds, working with sunsets, sunrises. Audio and sound, what exists in the world? Is it, you know, diegetic and non-diegetic sound? Um, looking at uh, environmental sounds, insects, birds, what kinds of mammals do we have in our world? Plowing through lots and lots of libraries. Um, and this is a lot of the core work that I'm doing now, uh, um, this, this, as this, um, this aspect here. Um, naming locations, you know, uh, the towns, the rivers, the mountains, writing cinematics, working on the onboarding story, um, character backstories, and writing. So writing for video games is very, very different from any kind of writing. Um, you're not writing a book, you're not writing a screenplay, you're not writing a poem. Writing very, very specific barks, which is what uh, you do as a player, uh, the intense, the dialogue system, creating very, very complicated dialogue systems, uh, creating a dialect, for example, for the for the world that we're creating um, is a very specific kind of writing. And I can say that this has been extremely difficult. It's been very, very challenging. I've had to work very closely um, in a writer's room with people from um, Xbox, uh, my colleagues in New York, um, and I've learned a great deal in the process. Um, art, VFX, tech, art and lighting, you know, what we build in the world different kinds of assets, uh, what goes into a building, what goes into a room, um, what you know, what you see on a street. Because, because Contraband is an open world game, everything that you see in the world has to be built. Everything that you see in the world has to adhere to a, a system of logic. Why is it in the world? Does that asset look out of place? Um, we're, we're always adapting to what the game is. And of course, you know, when you start making a video game, it's not what you end up with is not the same thing that you started with. So there's a constant process of, of looking and relooking, of editing and reviewing, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and of course, you know, this includes lighting. What kind of light do we have in the world? What is the source of light? Where does it come from? Everything adheres to a system um, of logic. And it's very much like building a world from scratch. Um, very complicated, but very, very exciting. And um, this is a role that is very, very important to, um, to who my presence here in, in the studio, because I'm a Southeast Asian um, creative working in this team. 
Um, so the creative direction of the game, I'm working very closely at the moment with uh, key directors at Avalanche and at Xbox in creating a very unique vision of the world and ultimately creating a play experience that is fun, compelling and meaningful. And I believe that is the end of the slide. Um, I'm gonna end with a, a trailer of Contraband. Now, mind you, this came out, I believe more than two years ago, and it's really out of date. The game that we're making is, of course, it's still grounded in this world, but it's, it's kind of, yes, we are making this game, but we're not really making this game anymore. So, but have a look anyway, because it is in the public domain and that's all I can talk about right now. So, so yes, have a look. This is our trailer for Contraband. Okay, happy to uh, take some questions or if Shivani or Sheena, you wanna kick this off, um, go ahead. Okay, um, yes. Uh, all right, everyone, uh, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. Yes, we have Holiday who has raised their hand. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask, um, how has your experience in prose translate into game writing? Oh, everything, everything um, helps. <laughs> I think understanding prose and understanding how to use prose in creating a fictional world is, is, you know, instrumental. It's, it's critical. It's in understanding um, video game writing. Everything helps. But it's it's really important to to know that yes we are creating a world the same rules apply you know you're creating a setting you're creating conflicts you have to understand character you have to understand backstory you have to understand how they move in the world what is the hero's journey it everything relates to video games and interestingly a lot of people who work in game dev in the narrative um, teams have studied creative writing so whatever it is you're doing now it's gonna help you get a job in game dev if you want. So yes, everything helps. Okay, uh, Jay White Town had their hand up earlier. Do you still have a question? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, I was going to type my question up, but uh, I'll just ask it verbally. Um, hi, Miss Bernice. Uh, Hello. I'm a former student of yours, not sure if you remember Hello. me. Anyway, yes, my question is, <clears throat> um, how did, you personally get your job with contraband um did you reach out did they reach out to you and um earlier when you said that game the role of game writer it still revolves around tech to some degree um for writers who have zero tech background what would you recommend as a first step mm. Yeah, well, it's been a huge learning curve. Um, how did I get the job? Um, well, it was, I believe, end of 
2019 or early 2020. Yeah, it was around about the pandemic and just before the pandemic hit, just before we went into full lockdown. Um, I got a call from a Singaporean poet friend um, who is also on, the, on, and I can't really mention his name at the moment because we're, we're NDA'd to the hilt. Like, um, <laughs> um, yes, he said that he asked if, um, and he knew that I was looking for work uh, because it was, it was a difficult time and I was, you know, finding myself um, in a very precarious situation. Mm -hmm. So this job actually saved my life. This job really, literally, in many, many ways, saved my life. Um, I got a call from him saying, hey, you're a nerd. I'm a nerd. Um, do you want to be working on a project that will make us feel like real nerds? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Um, so he put forward my name. Um, to Rebe Rebecca Deans, who is a producer at Avalanche here in Stockholm. And I got a call sometime in March asking if I would like to work on this project. And of course I said, yes. And that's how it started. So I started um, with the advisory committee, which is like I said, a panel of experts from Southeast Asia and around the world um, who are heavily invested in <clears throat> creating an ethical world. And that led to a narrative job and um, I wrote from, worked remotely in Kuala Lumpur for 18 months before they moved me to Stockholm in October of 21. And um, it's been a huge learning curve. Um, you know, I'm not really a gamer. I wasn't really a gamer, my daughters are, but at the same time I was um, interested and of course understand, um, I understand narrative and I understand what it means to create a world. So, uh, so it's been a huge learning curve. Um, I've learned a lot about tech. I've learned a lot about game dev. I've had to do a lot of research and immerse myself in a world that, that is sometimes, uh, you know, terrifying. And so unlike anything that I know, um, so you have to work really hard, but I think that there are, there are schools, of course, there, there, there are schools where you can learn game dev. Um, there's a school here in Stockholm called Future Games where you can learn to, uh, narrative design. But at the same time, it depends on what kind of role you want to come in. Um, um, there are lots of jobs available in video games, and that's one thing with, with game dev. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an industry that is just going to expand even more and more and more in the future. So this is my story. This is how I got into it. Um, and I've been working on, on Contraband for almost three years now. And uh, yes, it's transformed my life completely. So how you get there is it's um, really kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> okay, thank you, Miss Vinice. You're welcome. We, we have how another- How do I, I have, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out how I can read the comments, because there are- uh, Yeah, there are comments. comments. I can read them out to you. So there's one question here. Yeah. Hi, Benice, it's Isaac. You may or may not remember having taught me. Uh, how many writers are required in producing a game of, say, contraband scale? Are prospects of promotion good for junior writers hoping to climb the ranks? Hi, Isaac. Yes, of course I remember you. Um, at the moment, in our narrative team, we have four people. Um, we have a narrative lead. I'm the senior writer. We have two narrative designers. So it's a very small team, but it's a very key team. Um, junior writers, I guess you have to, depends on what kind of game. Again, it, it really depends on the kind of game that you're making. Um, some games are more narratively driven than others, as, as, as I've mentioned. And how you get in as a junior writer, of course, there's, there's you know, um, there's a, a definite sense of, it's a very democratic um, system in most studios where you can, you, know, you, you earn, um, you spend a bit of time doing one role, and then of course there are always ways of, of getting promoted and of learning more. Um, a lot of people that are in game dev have come from different industries as well. Um, the guy next to me, Lewis, um, is our current game designer. He used to be a bartender, a chocolatier, yeah, um, and he's now a game designer. He went to Future Games, is that right? Future Games, and. Um, you know, learned to be a programmer and here he is in, in games. So you can come from all kinds of different industries, um, but at the same time, it's, it's you know, it is a challenging industry. Like I did say, it's kind of chaotic, but there are ways and means of sustaining yourself. And it's, uh, you 
get to work with some really, really, really amazing, very cool individuals. And that's been a great part of my my job. Thank you. Um, thank, an, thank you, uh, Ben. It's lovely to see you again. You too. <laughs> There's another question. Hello, I heard that most of the writing for video games is done by the programmers and directors instead of professional writers. Is this a misconception? Well, yes, I mean, it's it is true um, in some studios, but at the same time, this is why I think that, you know, real writers need to come into the fray. We need to inform better game writing we need to inform better player characters we need to inform better worlds and that's why i feel that right now it's it's a really interesting time to work in um in game dev because there's so much potential there is so much potential and again as i said earlier nobody cares about your stupid story but at the same time if you're building a game that is hardwired into a specific kind of world which needs a very strong narrative structure that role is more important and more crucial than ever so yes, games are, you know, if you look at The Last of Us, that is solid writing. That is solid character building. That is solid world building. That comes from a writer. That comes from someone who understands the craft of writing, who understands what it means to create a world that makes sense. We need to make games with worlds that make sense. And a lot of that comes from um, the role of a writer who is pushing for things to make sense. Um, so yes, in a lot of games, I think currently and in the past, um, a lot of the writing was done by programmers, but that needs to change because the industry is changing and the role of the writer is more important than ever. Thank you. Um, I hope that answers Matthew F's question. Um, then we have another one from Yoon L. A bit niche, but I've always imagined myself playing a game with a Titanic theme. I'm thinking of potential storylines that can build a game related to the film. Not entirely sure what, whether that's a question there or a comment. Um, uh, but it's there, you know, if you'd like to come online and explain. Uh, no, it's just a comment. OK, right. Thank you. Um, all right. Edward F wants to know, Hi, Miss Bernice. May I ask what is an advice that you would give to fresh grads looking to go into this industry? Yeah, just, you know, look for jobs. Um, get on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where um, the games industry really, really uh, works. Set up a profile, um, look for jobs. And just be willing to, you know, I think it, it, it helps to to arm yourself with some knowledge of understanding what game dev is and how, what the process is and what is involved in understanding a little bit of tech. Um, I've had to learn the hard way, but at the same time, because um, I come from an, you know, an understanding of, of, of writing, of, of, of creating a world, of creating a story that sustains itself over a period of time. Um, that kind of knowledge and experience is invaluable in game dev. You just need to be able to start something, go through the different motions, and then finish it. So understanding that is, is of course, important. Um, there are a lot of jobs out there. Whether they suit you or not um, depends on the kind of project that you're working on. So you have a lot of different studios that make different kinds of games. Avalanche, uh, the game that I'm working on now, Contraband, is is, a, is AAA, so that's really big. It's really big. It's open world, so there are a lot of different layers that go into it. There are also studios that make smaller games, indie games, and that's a different kind of writing. And that might be something that you might want to start there. Instead, start with smaller studios that are making smaller games. Um, there are a lot of game companies in in Malaysia right now that are making that are indie studios that are making very very cool, really interesting games that are set specifically in Southeast Asia. And with this just a statistic I, I read earlier that you know Southeast Asia is, is the, the biggest growing market. It's not just in gamers, it's also in studios that are making games. So yeah, just do a bit of research, set up a profile on LinkedIn, look at jobs that are available in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, in Singapore. There are also studios that you can join. Um, so yeah, it's um, 
it's um it's an industry that that will grow and continue to grow and um the benefit of working in games to a degree is working remotely but of course you want to be in an office with your with your colleagues so that you're all learning from each other and you're all part of a team um but yeah there are there are multiple ways in which uh, one can work but arm yourself with some knowledge and and you know if you're serious about getting into this industry um there are many ways of going about it thank you uh luyan yi has a question Hi, Bernice. Thanks for the talk. I wonder if physical board games and video games are similar in terms of world building and writing design. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, board games, of course, are. Um, I think that the way in which you approach a board game, you're still creating world. If you look at Dungeons and, Dra Dungeons and Dragons, for example, it's it's still role playing. You are, you know, you're in a fantasy. You you still have to run campaigns. There are missions. There are characters that you're working with. So, the fundamental structure of it is still the same. You're not working with tech. That's the only difference. You're working with with figures, with figurines, like you know, like this, like my my little Grogu here. Mm -hmm. um yes i am a nerd um yeah so yeah the the only difference is that you're not really working with tech you're working with a different kind of system you're not working with a system that deals with tech um i so in my mind that would be the biggest difference but i think again the fundamental of the structure of the game is the same okay so we have another question um from Hiti um saying if there's time hoping for one more answered uh, why do you think some studios avoid depth in storytelling? Why do we have so few of The Last of Us and Red Dead Redemptions? Would there be more demand for real writers in the gaming industry? That's a really good question. That's something that I ask myself all the time. Red Dead 2 is a fantastic game. Um, Last of Us is also a very beautiful game. It's, it really speaks to the human condition. And it depends on what the studio wants. You know, are you making a game that is a shooter? Are you making a Valorant? Um, or are you making something that has pathos and hubris that really challenges you as a player um, to put yourself in a situation of someone like, um, like Ellie or Joel, for example? Um, it depends on the studio. It really depends on the budgets that they have. Is it an indie game? Are you working with a big publisher like Xbox or PlayStation or Nintendo? I mean, it really depends. Um, is it something that is is purely fantastical? Like, is it something like an Elden Ring? You know, it's it really depends. Um, but again, you know, I think the premise of, of this talk was that in making narrative-driven games, this is the task of the writer. Um, and in other games that are perhaps more um, more gameplay focused, there may not be so much of a need for a narrative writer. Um, and this is where the programmers and the designers come into play and they do most of the structure of the writing. It's a lot more simple. Um, you don't have complicated buckets where you make a choice. You don't have complicated options. You don't have as many choices. So it really, really depends on the kind of game that we're talking about. But specifically with narrative driven games, um, the role of the writer and the narrative designer are absolutely crucial. Hope that answers your question. Kaivin has a question. He's they've got their hand up. Please, you can unmute yourself and ask your question now. Kaivin. Hi, Bernice. Uh, I'm Kaivin. Not sure if you remember, but a uh, former student. I have a feeling that a lot of us are. But... <laughs> I wish I could see you guys. My God. <laughs> Would be fun to do this in person, I think. Um, but yeah, I just had a question because I do understand that sometimes in game dev you work under a lot of time pressure. So if you don't mind, I wanted to ask how you reconcile that with the creative process of writing. Oh, yes, I'm sure you've all heard of something called crunch. Um, crunch is when um, you have to meet a deadline. The game has to be shipped. Your publisher is breathing on your neck. It has to be shipped, it has to be shipped. And everyone's just working overtime. The rate of burnout in the games industry is very, very, very high um, because it is all consuming. And I can say that honestly for myself as well. Uh, and in, in Sweden, the work-life balance is very strict. You only work eight hours a day. 
you get X amount of days off a year, you go on holiday and you just completely detach. You just do not check Slack. You do not check emails. It's a very, very strict rule in our studio. Um, so the time factor is, of course, uh, you know, time is money, right? And I think in a, in a project like, like ours, it's time is a lot of money. In the AAA projects, we're looking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so yes, there is a lot of pressure. There is a lot of stress. Um, with the, you know, the chaos that is game dev and the pressures and the deadlines and meeting milestone after milestone and then trying to work together as a cohesive team um, and trying to make sense of what you're doing can be extremely challenging. And that's why it takes so long to make a game and every game that is produced is nothing short of a miracle. So time is very important. Um, games get delayed all the time because it's complicated. It's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. But here in Stockholm um, and you know where I work in, in Suriname, it's kind of like the games hub. We've got EA over there, we've got DICE over there, Paradox is down the road. So it's kind of a games hub and it's, you know, you, you see people who work in game dev on the street all the time. And, you know, the, Avalanche has a culture of where we look out for each other. It's a really nice place to work in. Um, yeah, and we are creating a new IP. It's a very exciting time, but it's also extremely challenging. And, it you know, we've been working on this game for almost four years now and we still have a while to go. So time is of the essence and time is something that is sort of, you know, binary and vernacular and it's like, yes, it is what it is, but uh, you try and have fun in the process and um, don't go crazy and don't burn out. <laughs> we have, uh, I think about Thanks, three or four sorry. questions. Oh, sorry. We have about no, three or four questions. Um, yeah, we can go a little bit over time. It's not a problem. Okay. It's, it's fine. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so Christine says, hi, Benice, just want to say you're so cool. And uh, <laughs> also, what's your favorite video game right now? Hmm. I, I really like, oh, that's a cool, hmm, let me think. Okay, I'll just tell you what I've been playing. I've been playing Sleeping Dogs, which is a really, really great game um, that's set in Hong Kong. Um, it sort of became this cult classic and uh, there was talk of a remake, but not, that's not happened. I'm also playing um, Witcher 3, which I really like because I like all the different narrative pickups in the world. Um, I've played Sea of Thieves. That's a really, really fun game, co-op. You can play that with, with friends. Um, and I recently just started playing this very cute little game called Citizen Sleeper, which is brilliantly written, absolutely brilliantly written, um, Citizen Sleeper. So again, it's a very, very, it's not a AAA game. It's a very small indie game, but it's, it's very, very good. Um, and the quality of writing in that is fantastic. So yeah, Citizen Sleeper, Richard Three, Sleeping Dogs. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely should check them out. Um, Lu Yan Yi asks, how do you ensure that a game is replayable? <laughs> that's the million dollar question. Um, and that's why the system and all the designs have to sort of make sense. They all have to sort of adhere to each other and speak to each other. Um, and this is we're making. Um, if it's open world, if it's co-op, it has to be replayable, you know, because a player can start a game and then leave the game and then come back in two months or two weeks or two hours. How do you sustain that replayability? Um, that's the hard part. That's the really hard part. And that's why it takes so long to figure that out because you have to figure it out. It takes, you know, a team to figure that out, but it needs very, very cohesive, creative, intelligent, imaginative direction. That's what makes a good game. Faith says, Miss Bernice, we miss you with a sad face. And oh. after that, we have a question. Hi, Miss Bernice. Since dialogue is a crucial part of writing for video games, do you have any tips to make your written dialogue more engaging? 
Yeah, well, you know, um, there are players who skip dialogue completely and skip cutscenes completely, and that's so like, oh no, don't do that. We spent so much time doing that, and <laughs> um, it's tricky, and it's it's a it's. So it's, uh, it's tricky, it's hard, it's just hard. And you just have to learn to do it in a way that is catchy, that, you know, it, it has to be catchy. Um, it has to make sense, it has to be fun, it has to be, you know, what is, what, are you, what is the intent of the dialogue? Why are you saying it? Where are you saying it? How are you saying it? So all of these things matter, everything matters, but there's no one way of writing, you know, dialogue. You just have to figure it out for the game that you're making and for the character that you're writing it for. So there is no one way to do it. it. You just have to figure it out. Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out to everybody, since we'll be going over time, uh, we have we still have a few more questions to answer. So maybe I think we can we can't be accepting any more questions. OK, um, and just now another one got added. <laughs> OK, Abhitya says, hi, Miss Benice, another former student here. How do you prevent or deal with creative writing uh, burnout when assigned to such a big project? Uh, yeah, well, it's not just burnout for you know for me. It's it's the entire team um, because it can get very stressful. Um, so yeah, the work life balance is very important. So normally on Fridays I go to a place called Hellas Gordon um, and I go for a dip in the lake. I go for a sauna, which is a very Swedish thing to do. It's a very Nordic thing to do. Um, and I have developed um, affinity for cold water swimming. So if there's ice on the lake, I will still go in the lake. If it's in the <laughs> summer, I will still go in the lake. Um, yeah, some of my colleagues think I'm crazy. But um, for me, it's it's a really, really wonderful way to de-stress. I go for very long walks in the forest on Sundays. Um, Sweden has uh it's it's you know this word is hardwired into everyone it's alaman stratton and it's the freedom to roam so you can go anywhere you can walk anywhere you can forage for food in the forest um there are no borders this is why sweden was the only country that didn't have a lockdown um so yes there are pros and cons of course um but yeah i uh, make full use of that um, that philosophy, and it's something that has really, really sort of helped change my mindset. I'm still working, of course. I'm working on a new collection of poems. I have an idea for a graphic novel um, that I might be working with with an artist I met in Berlin. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But it's trying to create that balance between this job, which is extremely stressful, and my personal life, which is not so stressful. So it's finding that balance, which is... Um, and that's something that comes from the very top management. It's like, you need to take time off. If you need to take time off, take time off. So I'm very, very glad that uh, we, we have that option here. Thank you. Um, Kat says, since you're a huge Star Wars fan, any hopes to work on their game someday? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> We shall see. I don't know. Um, we'll see. That would be a dream. That would absolutely be a dream, but we shall see. Throw it out into we the universe. <laughs> manifest it. Uh, Lu Yin yeah. Yi wants to know, does writing the game ruin the playing of the game for you? Um, no, it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. You should be, you should feel extremely proud of what you've done. Um, because one thing that we do well at, at Avalanche is we are very good at creating beautiful worlds. Mm -hmm. And we have a very, very beautiful world. And I'm very proud of what we've done in it, with it, for it. Um, we still have a long way to go. But um, I, I want to feel a sense of pride about what I'm doing. Because it's taken so much effort and, you know, sweat and tears and and... Some days you just ask yourself, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's 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 because it's hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, and it's not just up to me. It's up to the entire team. I love working with my colleagues. I have um, amazing colleagues. We're all very talented in our own different ways. Um, but yeah, I would like to feel that this is something that I can be extremely proud of when it's done. And uh, I hope for that. I really hope for that. 
Luyanyu continues, there's another part to their question. And do you realize things that the player don't necessarily realize as a writer when you play the game? Yeah, I think, you know, because you go through so many different processes and reviews and there's so much feedback, you know, you have hundreds of eyes on one thing all the time. So it's constantly being reviewed um, by the team itself, by our publisher um, from Xbox. So we there's a constant process of negotiating, like what works, what doesn't work, what works, what doesn't work. It's a very complicated process. There's no one way, again, of, of making something. Um, yeah, so it's just, you know, sorry, I've just completely forgotten the question now. Um, <laughs> uh, it's that, yeah. uh, do you realize things that the player doesn't necessarily right. realize as a writer when you play the same game? Yeah, and it, because it, it also depends on where you are in the world, because we're making an open world game, so you can be anywhere in the world and how the, it's it's all about reacting. The player has to react to the world. It's, it's you know, it's that makes the the... the replayability of it um, absolutely crucial as well so it really depends um it really depends on where you are in the world what the task is what is being done what you have to do next who you're engaging with you know it's not just one entity in a world you are engaging with the world all the time much like you are in you know a street in the middle of traffic or you know if you're in the forest or if you're in outer space it's you have to put yourself in that world all the time and see what you need to engage with how would you you know it, it, that it's just putting yourself in the player's situation and learning from that process and again you know iterating what you know and then when another layer comes on if you know suddenly there's a rock there that wasn't there before okay let's iterate that on top of everything else so it's it's a very complicated process yeah let's just tell uh, one putting yourself question in the, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you, you were saying? No, 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 it's a complicated okay. process. It's, it's all. So we have one question left and a couple of very sweet comments that I thought I'd read them out to you. So Zhiwe says, I have to go now, but Bernice just wanted to say thank you so much for the talk and it's so good to see you again. I was your ex-pandemic student. All the best for contraband. And uh, one that I find particularly hilarious, um, Hiti says, uh, yes, I show the contraband trailer to my friends. Tell them I have a teacher writing video games in Europe as if I have anything to do with it. <laughs> um, this is the final question by Jinti um, saying, hi, Miss Bernice, we missed you. I was wondering what's your favorite part of game dev, which I think is a wonderful way to kind of end it. Yeah, it's your favorite part of game dev. Oh, wow, that's a... Uh, that's a question I haven't really thought about. Um, what's the favorite part of game? I still like coming to the office. I like coming to the office because, you know, I was working on this game remotely for a very, very, very long time. Um, and I just needed to be in the presence of my colleagues uh, who are incredibly talented and wonderful human beings. Um, and I am starting to really enjoy living here in Stockholm. I never ever thought I would end up in the Nordics. I mean, this job has you know never in a million years would i've ever thought that i'd be working in game dev um or living here or you know making a game like this but it's i don't know i i, I don't know it just makes sense that that i ended up here that the intersection of all the work i've done um in the creative industries for so long has led me to this path um the best part is hoping that we will make a game that matters that will be groundbreaking in a way, and that will be a product that we're all part of. That's that's what I hope for. Okay. Thank you so much, Bernice. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk to us about this and answering all of our questions. Sorry, was somebody saying something? Oh, no, I think that was a... in your, okay. <laughs> um, so I hope everybody enjoyed this session as much as I did. Um, so thank you so much, Bernice. I was wondering before we all leave that maybe we can take a nice group photo online. So maybe if everybody switches on their um, cameras, that we can actually do that. That would be great. Yes. Um, Sheena, once the 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's, so we have all of the pictures, all of the camera turned on. Lovely. Mine's not working, so <laughs> I'm not going to be included. Sorry about that, Inakshi. <laughs> I'm sad, but what to do? Okay, let's see. View, let me just put everyone in Lodge Gallery so I can take everybody's pictures together. Okay, that looks great. So are we all ready? Okay, put a smile on. So in three, in three, by three seconds, yeah. Three, two, one, smile. And let's take another one with a different pose, hopefully. One, two, three, smile. All right, lovely to get. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that was adorable. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming today and thank you so much to Bernice for sharing thank all her you. expertise with us. Um, <laughs> Not quite expertise, Bernice. just just experiences. Hi. Oh my god, Hi. it's so good to see all these faces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many ex students in the in this meeting. Oh wow. Really? But, oh. Yeah, many, many, many. Oh, that's 40 great. plus. That's really great. Yeah, wow. we had a really, really good turnout, Bernice. Mm. Um, that was really fascinating as well. I mean, such a complete <laughs> new. <laughs> I just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm learning lots of things just from from you talking mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, very challenging, of course, but uh, no, it's a whole new world. <laughs> Definitely, whole yeah. Whole new world. Um, Any I, I, on your books? Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, listen, I have to go. I have not, I was supposed to have gone for yep. this meeting at four, so yep. I, I have to run. But thank you so yeah. much for. Maybe you can have you back, uh, back, back again soon. Yeah, I'll be back in Malaysia in the summer for a couple of weeks, uh, from June, sorry, end of July to early August, just for two weeks. But I'm not sure if you, you guys are probably on holiday on summer break then. Yeah, I mean, I'll be around. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Please yeah. drop, drop, yeah, drop us a line. Let <laughs> let me know when you're back. And uh, okay. someone mm -hmm. suggested doing a, a video games module. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk to Bernice. Like, how would you design that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, our engagement director is um, is very experienced, and yeah, there are people who can definitely teach for sure. Not me at the moment, but there are definitely mm -hmm. people who can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be very useful, you know, it will be very, very useful, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably get a lot of students for it as well. For yeah. sure. I think, for sure, yeah. not surprised, yeah. No, I yeah. think you should, you should definitely consider it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Or integrate some elements at the yes. moment, you know, pre-existing yes. modules. Yes, yes that's mm -hmm. true. So let's talk more, Bernice. Um, it was yes, really, really okay, nice to see you again. Glad to see you looking well as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, take, take care. care. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.